how did you come to write Anna Green Gables? That's interesting. <laughs> Remember I told you about this sweater? I was doing it in a review called Fine Frenzy. We were going to call it Fall Freeze, but we thought that Spring Thaw might sue us. And I was, I was supposed to go to London and do a play with Donald Cook called uh, King of Hearts. Gene Kerr wrote it. A wonderful comedy. He died. So we canceled the production. I was left high and dry. I said, well, what we're going to... And Norman, I, I did this review at the Avenue Theater with Dave Broadfoot and Araby Lockhart and Jane Mallett and Eric House and wonderful people. And, and uh, so Norman Campbell came to visit his sweater because I was doing Charlie Farkin. It was the year that Marilyn Bell, at age 14, swam across Lake Ontario. So Charlie was going to swim down near Niagara on the lake where it's about a mile and a half across. And I had long underwear and the sweater and the hat and the glasses. And, and uh, Charlie says, I plan to start across as soon as she's can. And, and I, he claims that underneath his underwear was a coating of Crown Brand corn syrup to keep him warm. <laughs> anyway, so Norman came to see me, to see his sweater. And, and he came backstage, and we joked about the fact that I hadn't given it back to him. And uh, then he said, I've got 90 minutes of television time. The CBC wants me to do anything I want. I said, aren't you lucky? Do it. I said, why don't you do one of those musicals you did with Bob Goulet? And he said, I, I can't think of an idea. And I said, well, I, I'm reading a book to my kids. And I said, it, it's, I, I usually make fun of the pet fairy tales, but I'm reading this book straight. And it's called Anne of Green Gables. And I said, I think this little girl is so full of imagination that it would take a song to fulfill what she imagines. And so I said, I think you could do a musical. And so we sat down, he and his wife and I, did a 90-minute black-and-white television show, 1956. Wow. And uh, 1964. With songs? Huh? With songs. With songs. Yeah, yeah. Phil Nimmons did this. Uh, orchestrations. And yeah. John Draney was Matthew. And that became the basis for the musical, the stage music? Well, the point is, uh, Johnny Wayne was doing a, music, a variety show to welcome the Queen to the new Confederation Center in 1964, which was the centenary of the meeting of the Fathers of Confederation trying to carve out a country. So he said to Norman, can I use the title song from your Anna Green Gables? He says, we need something about the island. So Norman said, sure. So he, they did the song in the show. And the Queen came backstage and said, that's a rather pretty tune. Where's the rest of the show? So Maver phones me in California where I'm working in television. He says, that's a royal command. I said, OK, get the rights. And that's how it started. Wow. Yeah. Now you and the queen started it. Wouldn't have happened without her. Again, that's luck, talent. Yeah. You know, happenstance, it's so much part of our profession. We can't get over it. And the fact that it's had such longevity. I mean, the projects you've been involved in have such longevity yeah. to them. I've written five musicals, but that's the one that uh, has lasted. I still want to do the other two, revive the other two. One's about World War II, which is kind of, we did a one night stand of it last year at the. Uh, Todd Morton Mills Theater. Jim Betts has a thing called Script Lab. We did six Canadian musicals in one week. And ours is called Private Turvey's War. It's about World War II. Earl Burney, the poet, wrote it. Funny book. And, uh, but you know, the, I'm a veteran of World War II, but I, I never got overseas. I did daylight sweeps over London, Paris, and Bradford. <laughs> so, I don't know how many guys are left. I'd love to do it in, 19, in 2009, which is the 70th anniversary of World War II. And then we did a wonderful, I think the best musical we wrote is about Emily Carr, called The Wonder of It All. Right, and that had a performance? On television. Right. That's where we started everything, yeah. 
And what anyway. is it about Anne that has been uh, so, that it may, had it last so long? Well, I want it to be a film, a Canadian film. That's the toughest. The people who work in Canadian films, I envy them. I mean, I'm so, I don't envy them. I, I just, I, I, I admire them so much. The toughest road to hoe in the world. But what is it about Anne of Green Gables that is stuck with us? And it's kept as basic as Cinderella. The loser comes out on top. And as a young woman. The reason the Japanese love her, the Japanese women love her, is because she's a feminist right. symbol. Right. Doesn't take any nonsense from the boys. But is there not something similar to the way Charlie Farkinson has, Farkinson has stayed with us? He's a, he's a character that has rung something he's in us. He's a memory of something most people have seen at one point, either on their vacation or at the CNE or stopping at a roadside gas station or something. And they say, yeah, I've seen him somewhere. And he's also a reaction to the, the complexity of life in the cities. Life is so complex and so multi-layered. And there's a simpleness from this man. However, interestingly twisted is his is his logic and his reasoning, but there's a simplicity about him that I think also appeals to us. Okay. I think, I think so. so. Well, he's not on his cell phone or looking at his Blackberry or wondering about his stocks. No, or he says that his boy Orville has got one of them cellulite phones <laughs> and it does everything, plays 1,500 songs I never want to hear, and it takes pictures. <coughs> And every time he answers the blame phone, he takes a picture of his left ear. <laughs> Does Charlie have a television? Sure, he has the TV. Have you got cable or satellite? No, they, it's where tubes is tied to the Canadian broad carping castration. 